Hi, everybody. I'm Anthony Vargas with Sound and Communications. And uh, I'm here with uh, Craig Jansen, Managing Director for Acoustic and Audio Technology Design Firm IDBree. Um, Craig, thanks for being here with us. It's great to be here. So uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking with AV professionals about how the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has been affecting them and their businesses. Uh, so just to kind of start off, uh, Craig, tell us how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected IDBree's like day-to-day -day operations. Well, like, like everyone, it's a new world and it happened in a week. And we went from going gangbusters uh, with everyone you know, flying all over the country, we do a lot of travel, to suddenly no travel, uh, to moving home, working from home and servicing our clients remotely. Some 70% of our work is through architects and um, they did the same thing at the same time. So we were navigating um, unyielding deadlines while basically entirely moving the company and the entire industry doing the same thing at the same time. So the immediate impact was how do we go digital uh, and work from home? It wasn't too much of a stretch from a technical point of view because we, like many firms like us, we're, we're, we're deeply in, embedded into digital technologies. Um, uh, we're in the cloud, we have strong VPN capa capacity, so we didn't have to reconfigure anything to do. We just literally just picked up computers and, and several of us took our chairs home. Um, I'm sitting in my nice Aeron chair here, which, you know, stole from my office. And, um, and, and we're up and running uh, that night. What was harder, of course, was the cultural shift, uh, navigating uncertainties, um, not only with us, but uncertainties in, the, in, in our clients who are all at the same time trying to suddenly they had kids at home, they had uh, spouses or they were the spouse that was suddenly at home and, and was unexpected. Th th that, that emotional move was much more difficult for us at least um, than the business side of, of the equation. So uh, speaking along the, along those kind of lines, uh, what what have what have you seen uh, change in your relationship with your clients or the back and forth with them? You know, like have you had to uh, schedule more meetings on like off business hours to kind of work around their family obligations or anything along those lines? Well, you know, I think one of the great things that's happened is it's been fairly spectacular. Is that this the the, the crisis has um, created a very level playing field across the entire world and it's humanized everything. And so all of a sudden, you know, that you, you, you have uh, children coming in and behind the camera and you're going, shoo, shoo, shoo. And, and almost everyone on the other side is going, look, it's okay, I get it. It's all right, I, I, I got some of those issues going on as well. And so I think that that has been really, um, really positive. Uh, I, so, so those are the kind of the upsides, the downsides is the fact that now we can't do face to face and we're having to navigate a different way of of um of engaging and where we we used to be pretty casual about you know because you do video calls but you know most of the time we're designing something and so we we care about what's on the big screen now i'm trying to look you in the eye and i'm and i'm not doing one of these things when i'm looking off into the distance so as professional media guys we should know that but we had to relearn some of those basic uh, principles of how do you work and how do you ne negotiate relationships in a digital world. It's been pretty fun, actually. So uh, IDBRI uh, offers a pretty, um, well, it, it, not so much a unique perspective because there, so, there are so many uh, design firms in the commercial <laughs> AV industry. Um, but uh, we've been talking to a lot of manufacturers and integrators and stuff like that. So uh, you're one of the first design firms that we've actually uh, talked with. So from a business aspect, um, what what aspects of your of your business have you emphasized as a result of the crisis, and which which aspects have been more de-emphasized? Well, I think um, first let me just talk for a second about the, the kind of the pipeline that works in the in the consulting world. Most of us, uh, and and at least most of the the larger teams work on new construction, and so we're we're in long lead projects. So I, I don't know what my average timeline is, but I, I would guess our average project is between two and three years in, in execution. So when this first happened, the immediate question is what's gonna, what's gonna shift in, in, in the workload, in our backlog? And most of us, uh, particularly on those doing new construction, are carrying 
you know, many months, something in the order of 12 months of their average monthly operating uh, expenditures in terms of backlog. So, so what was interesting is to, and, and to address your question, which, which is, you know, how did, how did it shift our, our service offerings? It depended on the market. So markets that were funded by, by equity money uh, stopped, we had stopped immediately, I mean, just dead. And they just said, we have very few projects canceled, by the way, but we've had a number go on hold. System social relations haven't shifted at all. And then there's those, for example, in the, in the church world or the performing arts world. Um, those in the, the church world and the performing arts world where the, everyone went cautious. Uh, with a lot of our projects um, went on hold rather than canceling. And it depends on the nature of, of, of the market. So equity money, private equity money projects just stopped literally almost in the first week. Um, they just, you know, in lower construction, which I'll come back to, uh, projects like our sports projects continued, the, at least for the initial part. Uh, our church projects, in many cases, if, depending on where you were in the phase, if they're talking to us about starting it, they're going like, we're really busy right now. We have, we have some other things going on to know. To recognize and say most of our clients are really swamped with life at the moment. And we need to be the easy button, not, not the ones chasing them. Uh, so the, to answer your question more specifically about, about you know, what offerings are people calling us for? Mostly they're saying, um, we, we're really swamped trying to navigate what the world looks like. Do what you said you're going to do, do it on time and be effortless about it. And, and so that's been a lot of our focus. A number of churches in particular have reached out to ask about streaming, live streaming. Our pro clients on the side of, of churches are very sophisticated and that some of those who are, let's say, some of the more traditional churches are less sophisticated. Uh, in sports world, most of our clients are extremely sophisticated. And so they're not reaching out to ask uh, questions uh, in that regard. We are getting more of that on live uh, our performing arts world where those kinds of conversations are happening. So it's a mission. I don't know what the future looks like right now. So Craig, you mentioned that um, a lot of your uh, clients, uh, are, they're not so much canceling projects, but they're putting projects on hold and uh, it's varied among the various different uh, vertical markets. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a three-dimensional issue. The, on, on, the, on the one dimension, it depends on the market type. Uh, so for example, if it's an equity funding model, the equity money just dried up immediately because that's, that's deep pockets um, that are driven by the, the in large market margin by the stock market. Uh, state projects continued, city projects got a little sketchy because they're all starting to get a bit nervous about what they're gonna do. Um, and so that's kind of the one side is the vertical market. The second part is where were you in the projects? So projects that were right in the very beginning, a number of them have gone on hold. Those are in construction, very few. Um, I think we've had one out of 170 projects that has stopped in construction, it's extremely rare. And so one of the interesting moves, and I think this will affect everyone in our industry and, 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 and certainly on the, the design builder side as well, is that new design is gonna slow down rapidly, but construction won't. So anything that's in existing, uh, we're adapting our forces to go well, if, I mean, to all intents and purposes, a balance of construction, or work that's being built right now compared to work that was in design probably shifted 40, 50%. And so all of a sudden we're going, well, how do we serve our clients during construction when at least right now we can't fly anywhere? And what does that look like? So those, those markets are very different. Geographically, we haven't seen much of a shift between East Coast, West Coast, Middle, and to some extent overseas. Um, got a project in Korea that went on hold immediately, it was a large church. And they, they just said, we can't even meet. We can't even get the building committee together. So, um, you know, so all over the map. And, uh, you know, regarding specific uh, service offerings, um, 
Was there was there anything that that uh, you're seeing clients placing more emphasis on or reaching out to you more uh, about or for the most part um, are those are the systems and the the projects you're working on kind of set not so much set in stone but sort of moving along those paths already? We we have a lot of vertical markets that we work in from from corporates to entertainment to performing arts to sports, uh, church, um, education. The, the only one that has reached out to us has been the church market on, on these issues, in part because I think if you look at the education, we're typically working on the upper end projects, and they've got a really robust uh, IT group embedded into those organizations, and so streaming and things of that nature is very advanced. Our higher end churches are all very good at that, and honestly could probably teach us quite a bit about streaming. Um, this is what they do every day. They've been doing it for years. Uh, they've explored and played with every tool known to mankind. But a number of the churches, uh, particularly those that are a bit more traditional, where they don't have video teams, they don't have a production team of 20 people, uh, but they've got a, you know some part-time people. Even though the projects may be substantial, the production capacity is lower. So they've reached out and we've spent a fair amount of time just counseling them on that. And, and honestly, most of that has been at no charge. Uh, these aren't complex conversations. It's just, you know, here's a couple of the tools you can use, here's the software services, um, you know, pretty straight. And some of it's, you know, look at the camera, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and how to get basic lighting to work right. uh, for, for a web conference. And so we've, we've done a fair amount of that, but that isn't really the core of our business. And, uh, and nor do I think it's an offering that will, will become the core of our business. So it's really just more about like keeping up that relationship, uh, maybe like having a, you know, uh, offer some consulting that's sort of outside your wheelhouse, but just kind of continuing to serve what the client needs and keeping that relationship strong. Sure. You know, we, we, we all know a lot about our industry in, in, in multiple areas. And we're, I, th I think one of the, the really good things that's happened in this, you know, you look for the, you look for the sunlight. And the sunlight is people are reaching out to each other on a human level and they're connecting and saying, hey, can I help you? And, and mean it. I mean, there's no, there's no ulterior motives in it. And so for us, at least, we want to be helpful. Um, you know, we, we want to take the skills we have and, and, and reach out to people. I was, on a, I was watching a web conference shortly before this with a, um, a sports group. And these guys are doing spectacular stuff, but the lighting really stinks on the web conference things. Now I'm not gonna mention the name. Um, and, and so I'm gonna reach out to them and say, can we help? Can we just, you know, let's just do a bit of one-on-one -on -one dialogue. I mean, we've got professional videographers, professional lighting designers who, can we help? And, and that I think is, is, is a great thing that's happening in, in this time is people trying to help each other. And then um, as far as, uh you know, advice, uh, especially on the management end for, um, for companies who are kind of navigating their way through this crisis. Um, you had written uh, two really insightful articles on the uh, topic of crisis management and the need to kind of adopt uh, that kind of standpoint uh, in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I just want to kind of touch on some of the ideas you brought up in those articles. And I also plan on linking to those articles uh, so our readers can read them. Um, so first of all, what would you say to business leaders who are still hoping to stick to their long-term plans and maybe haven't uh, woken up to the idea that we're very much in a new world right now? Well, I, you know, I would say that one of the hardest things of this is the emotional toll that it's taken on leadership, uh, particularly those who've been doing this for a while. You, you've got this vision of how things are going to be, and suddenly the cheese didn't just get moved, it got shredded. And it happened in an incredibly short period of time. So I think my first advice is give yourself some time to grieve. And honestly, we're probably, what, we're four weeks into this thing now. So your grieving probably should have come. But it's okay to be stressed. It's okay to acknowledge that this is a stressful deal and, and your vision that you had and spent a lot of time working on is now shifted. Then your next question is going to be, well, well what is the reality now? What does success look like for me now? And your success now looks radically different to what it looked like three months ago. And so, you know, to answer your question more precisely, I, I'm a big fan of strategic planning. I always have been. This is not the time to have a big strategy plan. That's not what's going on here. This is about having quick loops of good decision making that you, you say, what is, what is my minimum viable product for success? 
Is it staying in business? Would be good. Is it keeping my team together? Great, if you can do that in any way possible. And how do I set myself to come out of this in a way that we won't be so leveraged financially, over leveraged financially, that we're in trouble? And so everyone gets to set their own set of ideals. Uh, you can always go back to your big strategic plan down the road. And, and because it's all mapped, and, and not to mention, we don't even know what the future looks like or when it's gonna look like that. So I'd say that that would really be the biggest thing is you move from long three-year plans into one month quick loops of decision-making and action. And that's a very different culture, but it's fun too. And um, you know, in, in, that, uh, in that kind of migration to more short-term thinking, um, I'm sure there are a lot of difficult decisions that are gonna come up for managers. So what would you say for uh, business leaders who are facing some tough management decisions? How, how can they best uh, deal with those decisions? How can they face them, make smart decisions? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it varies from, from, from work to work. So I think most of us who are in permanent installation type context, you know, and I put us as a design consultancy practice in that world as well. So the, are on longer term projects. And so we've actually had a slower on-ramp compared to the live events industry, they were done in a couple of days. I mean, literally, they, they were going from, we don't know how to service our clients fast enough to, we have no clients in two days. So they're very different contexts. For the context that I live in, uh, the first thing was to be able to say, what are expenses? How do we def refine them? And no, and, and how, you know, one of those, by the way, is taking a pay cut if you're a leader. Um, you, you lead from the front, not from behind. You don't, you don't lay off people and then take a pay cut. You take a pay cut and then if you have to, you lay off people. And the second thing is saying, what does is, what is reality look like? Because everyone's wishful thinking. And very few of us did our financial analysis, except maybe some of the larger companies, did our financial wealth analysis on a weekly basis. In other words, exactly what are my expenses? How much cash should I get in? What did I win? Um, who's going to pay me? When are they going to pay me? What work do I have? And which of the work that I have is likely to go on hold, is likely to um, continue? And then how do those clients pay? So all of that takes a bit of time. So long would it answer to the short question is, I would, I would say to people two things. Number one, be gracious, um, be caring. Number two, get your ducks in their own, really knowing your numbers and be aggressive about it. Um, you've got to map out your scenarios and know if things don't go well, what are my action plans going to be and communicate it to your team. And two, if things go really well, what does that look like? Communicate that to your team and the metrics you use between those two are what you're going to communicate to your team. Our team, for example, knows how much we're billing, how much we're invoicing, how much we're, we're, we're um, collecting in cash. They know what our backlog is and giving them reports. Um, and so they have almost complete exposure to what we're doing financially. If we're going to impact their financial income, then they need they, they deserve the opportunity to know why. And then uh, just kind of to wrap up our discussion, I wanted to um, bring back a point that you raised uh, more towards the, the beginning of uh, when we started talking, um, just about how important it is to kind of keep that, keep your, your company culture strong, keep everybody within your workforce connected right. and on, on task and on the same page. Uh, what advice do you have for managers uh, with, regarding that? Well, I, you know, I think there's a lot of good companies out there and, and I, so I could share my, my, some of my experiences, whether that edges to advice, I don't know. Um, I, this I know is you don't start building your culture when you're apart. If your culture isn't already built, you're in trouble. Um, what you can do is build on the culture that you have. And so, the, the, the most difficult thing is we're apart and separated is keeping that togetherness. And there's no great genius of what we've done and we, we've, we've stolen those ideas from others, but we, we have a, a we're, we're on a t Microsoft Teams. So everyone's on Teams, everyone communicates one-on-one um, -on -one through video. We have what we call a water cooler, uh, which is just to go and you know, post interesting stuff and have you know, a bit of smack talk goes on in the water cooler. Uh, the, the culture of who you are and those relationships are more important than the work that you, you have because that will, will um, everyone's stressed and that stress is playing itself out in different ways. And so keeping those connections, those relationships strong is good. 
as a leader, make sure you sleep enough, exercise, um, work out. There's lots of opportunity to do it. Don't, don't check in. Don't drink. <laughs> you know? I, mean, I mean, it's just, you know, because people get bored at home. Um, be a leader. And, and to do that, you get up early and uh, you connect with people and you relate to them. And that's not always easy when you stress out, which leads me to my final comment, is reach out to some of the, your competitors that you're friends with. And we did as a, a consulting group, five of our company, five big consulting companies got together last Friday and we spent an hour on the phone together just saying, hey, what, you know, how are you guys doing? What, what are you seeing? And it wasn't sharing business secrets. This is entirely just seeing how we're all doing. Reach out to a competitor and do that because as a leader, you, it can be a lonely place. All right, great stuff. Uh, Craig, thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time to talk with us about this difficult subject. And, uh, you know, uh, we really appreciate you sharing your uh, insight on this situation. Thank you. I, I think the future is going to actually be really good. I just think it's going to be delayed. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's just not here yet. But when it gets here, we're going to have a new world and um, it's an opportunity to innovate. And that's always fun. So thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Thanks for doing it. Sure.